Last Sunday, does anybody remember what we looked at last Sunday? I want to remind you, last Sunday, the sermon title um, was The Serrated Edge of God's Truth. What in the world? Do you remember that uh, we had George Ramos here, one of our five-star chefs? We have a few chefs in the life of our church. Um, I've been gaining weight because of them, um, but uh, we're privileged to have that. But we, we started to look at this idea of God's Word, that there are the beautiful, beautiful passages that are very sweet and gentle and remind us of His kindness and His goodness, but there's also the passages that remind us of who He is and who we are not, that reminds us that we live in a fallen world. And vividly, His Word calls us to recognize that we need Him. And so, it's sometimes with a serrated edge, it's with a jagged edge that God reminds us of that truth. In fact, the main title, um, excuse me, the main passage that we're studying this morning um, is one of those passages that shows us the fact that God is calling us to wake up and to realize the dangers that are around us and he does, throw with a, he does so with a very firm rebuke. So this morning, we come to the message today, message 17, and the title is Teaching That Turns Away from the Truth. Um, we see this in the book of Titus. We see this here, that the teaching that the, the churches of Crete were under during this time of transition, it was a teaching that was turning people away from God. And this is a very dangerous thing. They may have been coming to gather in the church, but they were focusing on themselves and not focusing upon God. Notice here with me in the context and your page that's there um, below the box of the main Scripture, I want us to look at the, uh, the context a little bit. The Apostle Paul, if you're new to us this morning, Titus is all about this. The Apostle Paul has left Titus on the island of Crete to straighten out messed up churches. And those churches have problematic leaders, they have problematic doctrine, and they have problematic behavior. They're not acting, believing, um, they don't have leaders that are godly in all of this. They, they're not acting right, they're not believing right, and their leaders are leading them astray. Now, this is why, precisely why, Titus opens with verses 5 through 9 in the description of what godly leaders should be and do. So the first one that you want to fill in there um, uh, on that first Titus, or Titus chapter 1, verse 5 through 9 is godly leaders, what they should be and do. But the text that we're in now, verses 10 through 16, looks at the description of ungodly leaders. These are the guys that you shouldn't have. These are the messages that you shouldn't hear. These are the ones who are leading people astray. Now, what we said last week was God's truth sometimes has a serrated edge. And remember this image that's here, the serrated edge, this jagged edge that cuts deep, and it cuts deep in order for a good purpose. I want you to also fill this in. This cuts through sin and rebellion and deception in order ultimately to bring judgment and salvation. You see, God, in all of His glory, in all of His goodness, He brings His judgment and His salvation. And so this is part of what we see in this text that is definitely a jagged edge or a serrated edge. I want us to look and see the text. Notice here in Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 16, it says, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers especially those of the circumcision party. These are the people that are trying to make people Jewish before they're Christians. And so they're, they've come into the churches, and they're being combated here. Look at verse 11. They must be what? They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families, and here it is, by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Verse 12, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. So it's silence them, rebuke them, that they may be sound in faith. Look at verse 14. 
not devoting themselves, and here's the problem, to Jewish myths and to the commands of men who turn away from the truth. So Jewish myths and commands. Verse 15, to the pure all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. We're going to see what that means. Verse 15 is very important. Look at verse 16. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Now, is this text all about the sailors who hang out down at the port in Crete? Is that what this text is all about? Is this about all of the guys who hang out around the brothels and the bars and the seedy places? Is that what this text is about? What is this text about? It's talking about people that go to church. And specifically, it's talking about the leaders in those churches. The churches in Crete had a problem. They had a very big problem that wasn't discreet. You know what I mean? Um, so they, it, was a, it was a very obvious problem. And it was a grand problem that had to be dealt with. And so the Apostle Paul, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, gets out his serrated sword. And he, as he writes to them, he slices to them through them with the truth. So notice this and fill this in. We, we looked at this last week. Notice the serrated slash that's exposing the many ungodly leaders and teachers in those churches. A, last Sunday, we looked at their ungodly character. And we saw that in verse 10 and verse 12 and verse 16. So their character was bad. But now this morning, we look and see, at their, we look and see their ungodly teaching. This is the teaching that was a problem. And we just saw it in verse 11. Look at verse 11. They are teaching for shameful gain. Underline it there on your outline. What they ought not to teach. And why shouldn't they teach it? Because it's not the truth. And so this is teaching that actually turns people away from the truth, as we'll see here in just a moment. Verse 14, they are devoting themselves to Jewish myths. So think about it with me. Island of Crete is out there. Jews are really all over the Mediterranean world in different numbers. They've traveled around. They're industrious people. Um, back then, it was, it was a, that, that characterization is still there and was there at the time. They were industrious people. So they're in these centers. They're in these port cities. They're in these various other areas. And there were synagogues that were there. And then the gospel comes through, and some of those synagogues actually become churches. And others, they don't. They remain Jewish, but then churches are started out of that. So you have a high concentration of people who were formerly Jewish that are now meeting with Christians. And some of those Christians, a lot of those Christians, come from a Jewish background. Some of them came from a non-Jewish background. But nevertheless, amazingly, they're meeting together and they're there. But some of those old Jewish beliefs and some of those old Jewish, what he calls here, myths, began to weave their way into the teaching of the church, just like it had been in the synagogues. Well, what would some of those be? I've listed a few of them here. One of them was something called numerology. Now, we don't know. Paul doesn't mention which exact myths were there, but we know from various writings, not only in the New Testament, but outside the New Testament, we know that there, was the, there were various movements that came through Judaism that through a complicated scheme um, of numbering all the letters in the Jewish alphabet, they would number all of the letters with a certain numeric value, and then they would count those words and those numbers, and they would come up with certain numbers and then go back. It was almost like a cipher, and they would go back through the text, and they would get messages out of the text that weren't necessarily there. It was called numerology. It was the study of the numbers that were devoted to the letters in the Jewish alphabet. Have I sufficiently confused you? Okay. That's okay because it should be confusing. It was bizarre. It was weird. And, and yet it was strong in Jewish culture. And here it's probably one of the ones that was strong 
in the churches that were there. They were still going back through Old Testament texts, giving numbers, and getting messages out of this. And then notice here as well, superstitions. There's a, there can be all kinds of superstitions. Some of you come from different cultures and different areas that had a lot of superstitions. I have told you about um, some of the superstitions from here in the South that I grew up with my grandparents. Some of you from the Caribbean have come to me and said, oh, pastor, those look like nothing compared to some of ours. We, we had some too. And then South America, some of you have said, yeah, there's different, different superstitions that are there. And some of those are pretty elaborate. And so, in dealing with that, some of those superstitions would wind up coming into the teaching of the church. And then there's the Talmud and the Mishnah. This isn't the Pentateuch, um, the Torah of the Jewish people, but this is all of the rules that the Jewish community made up over a thousand-year period. And for a long time, they were orally transmitted. They were all of the rules. Okay, the Bible says, or excuse me, God's law says, you shall remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then there's some explanation of that we see in the Torah. Well, this was going way beyond that explanation. And we even see people in our culture here today that because of the Talmud and the Mishnah, they are abiding by many, 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 many rules that are very religious. And this is how you are to keep very legalistically the words of God. Well, that interpretation had even come into the church. The Talmud in the Mishnah was, was kind of coming and butting up against Christian philosophies. Now, before we're too judgment, uh, judgmental on the churches of Crete, let me just let you know that the Christian church today, here in America, even right here in Florida, even right here in Hollywood, is besieged with all kinds of other things, and some of them are constant and here even presently right now, and then others are, we can look in recent past. And I had a little bit of fun thinking through this and talking about this with a few people this week as I was thinking back about the various types of myths or doctrines that have come along. One of those things are apocalyptic predictions. These are like predictions about the rapture, predictions about the end time coming true, predictions about the end of the world. Some of you remember this one, 88 reasons why the rapture will be in 1988. Now, some of you don't remember that, or some of you right now, bad memories are coming back to you right now. But I remember as a sophomore in college, coming home and hearing people all wound up about this book, and there were some people that were very nervous about that, and there were several questions that Dan Sutherland rightly asked. He said, number one, why are you nervous about Jesus coming back? That's a good thing, and going to Christ is a good thing, but number two, the Bible very, very clearly says that no man knows the day or the hour. And so you can kind of rest assured he's not coming back in 1988 because so many people think that he is. So relax. I mean, you know, I mean, my goodness. It says do, no one knows it. No man can predict it. No man can state it. Well, I'll give it a few years. Look at the next one. Judgment Day, May 21st, 2011. These billboards were all over the world. Do you know what the yellow sticker says on the billboard right here? Can you read that? The Bible guarantees it. Well, what does the Bible guarantee? That it's May 21st, 2011? Now, if you remember or not, this was a 90-year-old gentleman that had hundreds of radio stations. He had a big voice. And somehow, you know, it's just kind of interesting. When you start talking about apocalyptic stuff, everybody starts listening. You know, if I were to announce a sermon series on the book of Revelation, they'd be hanging from the rafters. I mean, that, that's kind of the way, this, we, we're interested in those things. And that's a good thing. Those who study the book of Revelation are blessed. The Bible tells us that. And it's good for us to do that, even though we need to do so carefully, and we need to do so in such a way in which we keep the big picture of the truth of God in mind, instead of running to many who have created all kinds of divergent theologies. 
Now look at this other list that I have here. This is not on your outline, but apocalyptic predictions is at the top. But there's been various theological fads that have come through over the last few hundred years and certainly over the last 40 years. There's various worship fads. There's various cultural fads that make it into the church. There's various economic fads that come into the church. What about when mar multi-level marketing hits a church family and everybody's wanting to get together for coffee to make money off one another and maybe whatever you want to call it. I mean, some of you remember many of those things. Kind of weird. Some of you are involved with some of those things. Whatever. And I mean, we, you know, we're just kind of coming along. We're all growing. But, you know, there's, there's many things that can come into the life of a church that can distract from the truth. Um, entertain, entertainment fads. I, I, I have to tell you that I'm very concerned that many people who call themselves Christians at this day and time get a lot of their theology from Hollywood, California. The powerful medium of movies with its music and its artistic expression and all of the poet, poetic um, picture that is there. And, you know, Hollywood license, we even know what that means. Well, they took license with the story. You know, that, that means that they changed the story. We need to be very, very aware that, you know, movie producers are rarely our best theologians. And, and their, their voice is loud. Because we live in a culture that loves entertainment. We, we have hearts that love a story. God made us to love stories. Nothing wrong with that. It's just that we need to be very careful about the stories that we are continually feeding our minds on. And because many of those stories either are straight out of the world in contradiction to who God is and what he has said, or maybe even more dangerously, they are toying with the truth in presenting it. We need, we need to be careful about it. So there's, so there's entertainment fads. Some of these are distractions, and some of them are full-on deceptions. And so we see, I hope, I hope you see this morning, that this serrated message to the churches in Crete is a serrated message to Sheridan Hills. That we need to be the kind of people that is careful to keep our eyes on the truth of the gospel and not let things that contradict the gospel to come grab our attention, our interest, and our passion. And the only way to know the false thing very securely is to know the real thing. Mr. Bricker was a banker in this church. Um, his wife was uh, one of the principals in our school. And I grew up with David Bricker, um, his sons as well. And Mr. Bricker, who was a banker, I would love to hear about counterfeit money at the bank. Every now and then they would catch counterfeit money. And I would love for him to tell stories about that. And I said, well, how would you really know? I mean, this is before the days of the fancy little marker and some of those things. He said, well, the best way to know, he said the machines sometimes can miss the counterfeit. But he said the human hands by an experienced banker, when you're sitting there going through the money, counting the money, all of a sudden you can go, whoa, whoa, that's not right. And how do they know that that's not right? They're not even looking at it sometimes. They're so familiar with it that by the feel of it, by the, they're so familiar, listen, not with the counterfeit, but they're so familiar with the real thing that they can quickly identify that which is not the real thing. That's how the church needs to be. We need to be so familiar with God's word and God's truth and what is the gospel so that when the counterfeit stuff comes along, we can go, nope, that's not right. That is, in, that is contrary to scripture. And so that's part of the picture that is here. We see that they didn't have leaders that were even teaching them the right thing to help them be able to do that. Well, let's look on and let's keep going here. Verse 14 not only talks about the Jewish myths that were there, but look at verse 14, and this is where we're going to focus a little bit more time, is the commands of men who turn away from the truth. This is certainly, when, it, when, when you see the word command, circle the word commands in that, in that passage. You see, these are the legalistic commands of the law. 
This is going back to the Jewish law. This is, here's all these Christians on Crete, and they have leaders that are coming up saying, well, it's good you believe in Jesus, but you really can't forget the law. You still got to do these things in the law. You still need to observe these festivals. You still need to do these ceremonies. You still need to do these rituals. This is throughout the New Testament. Man loves to focus on what he can do instead of the picture of what God has done. And so we see this, that it's showing up here that these are certainly the, the legalistic ordinances and the requirements of the law and the Talmud that would have been there that are being pressed upon the people. Now, don't turn the page over yet. Very important words of Jesus right here. Mark chapter 7, verses 5 through 9. Jesus dealt with the same thing, and you talk about serrated edge. Jesus got out his serrated edge, and he dealt with the crowds that were around him through the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Notice this in verse 5. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Now, notice this. It doesn't say, why do they not eat, excuse me, walk in according with the Torah. It's not talking about Scripture. Here, it's the tradition of the elders. And the tradition of the elders in the Jewish society was this, the Talmud. And the Talmud said, when you come to wash, you must wash in a certain way. You must hold up your hands, let the water run down to your elbow, and let that, that be that way for a certain amount of time. And there were all of these reasons by which they did that, and they would stand, and they would wait before they would eat. And then, so there was a, there was a process that was here, and so they were sitting here watching Jesus' disciples. They knew what was going to happen. And they're just kind of watching, and Jesus' disciples sit down, they have a meal together, and immediately, here come the Pharisees and Sadducees saying, see, look, you guys are not religious. You guys aren't good Jews. You guys aren't good and godly people. You are not observing the tradition of the elders. So look at verse 6. And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written? You see that serrated edge? Look at what he says, and he quotes from Isaiah. These people honor, or this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines what? The commandments of men. And so we see that Jesus confronts this type of behavior that now the, has continued on after Christ has ascended the Father and the churches have been spreading. This continues on in the early churches, this very, very same Judy, Judaizing idea of forgetting the true fulfillment of the law in the sacrifice of Jesus, and it's going back to the law, back to the law, back to the law. Look at verse 8. Jesus goes on to say, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in, a, in order to establish your tradition. Now, do you detect a bit of sarcasm there? In fact, I've underlined it on the outline or on the, on the screen. Look what it says. Jesus himself says this. You have a fine way of doing this. You see, I'm not encouraging us to be jagged and serrated all the time. In fact, I really like being kind and gentle. But we need to recognize that God's Word is very, very clear, and we need to be very, very careful. And it's careful enough that Jesus would confront it hard. And do you remember why the serrated edge was needed? The serrated edge is needed to go through that which is what? That which is tough and hard and closed, and in cutting through it, it gets down to the, to the heart, and that's exactly what God's Word does. Flip your sheet over and look with me. There's a few things that we see in this passage that the ungodly teaching is, and so this is continued in this. The ungodly teaching was the exact opposite of the true gospel. It was the exact opposite of the true gospel. And we see this in verse 14. It's they, they're devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of the men 
who t- commands of men who turn away from the truth. So instead of holding on to the truth, this is the exact opposite of the truth. And we're going to see how much it's the exact opposite right here. Look at the next one here. This ungodly teaching was the age-old problem of religion. And what is the age-old problem of religion except this? It is works-based righteousness. Now, I plead with every one of us in this room to really, to really look at what is being said and look what is, what is being challenged here. Friends, this Titus passage is saying it's not all about what you're going to do. It is about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the true gospel. If you are depending upon anything else than the true sacrifice of Christ on the cross for those who believe in him, you do not have the gospel. In fact, you may be religiously perpetrating a, or promoting another completely opposing doctrine. It is not the grace of God that you're upholding. Look at the next next part here. This ungodly teaching chooses man's religion over God. You know, that's, that's not on your outline. The next one is here. Excuse me. This ungodly teaching focuses on what we do instead of what Christ did. That's the key. That's what I want you to see. And this is true not just with the with the Jewish folks that were infiltrating the churches, um, with Judaism beliefs in Crete 2,000 years ago. This is true right here. This is true at Sheridan Hills. That it's not about what we do. It's about what Christ did. It is all about Christ on the cross dying for the sins of man, creator of the universe, laying down his life that those who would believe in him can find true forgiveness, love, grace, and acceptance by a holy God. You see, this ungodly teaching that they were hearing, it's alive and well today. It's alive and well today. It's seen in either legalism or self-sacrifice. Fill those two things in. It's either seen in legalism or it's seen even in self-sacrifice. You say, well, yeah, legalism's got to be bad, but self-sacrifice, what's wrong with that? Let me tell you that both of these things can take you merrily to hell. Legalism, we're more familiar with from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s here in America. Legalism would be more of, well, you're supposed to go to church, and you're supposed to do this, you're not supposed to go do that, and you can't do this, and you can't do that, and everything else, and you better be a good, I mean, this is the Americanized problem. The Americanized problem would be that we look at others and we, we judge whether or not they're a good church member based upon you know, what they wear and what this, that, 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 that. And let me tell you that there are certain things that may be important to your Christian life. There's no doubt about it in the outplay of your faith. But that is not what saves you. And if you look around down your nose at everyone else about how holy you are and how unholy they are, now you're starting to talk about legalism. Now you're starting to talk about the judgments of men and the behavior of men being elevated over the grace of God. Now, it, can't, it may be on the opposite end of that, of not legalism in this way, but maybe it's the person who is, man, they're a free spirit. I mean, they, they are a free spirit completely. They're the furthest thing from legalism, but they say, you know what? It's all about my fellow man, and I'm just going to give my life for my fellow man. I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to live under a tree, and I'm going to let somebody else have my house, and I'm going to, you know, do this and do that. And they can be the most sacrificial person. And they, they may be very wealthy and be very sacrificial in some idea of that, or they may be very poor and self-sacrificing in this way, but they think that they are winning God's approval by their own self-sacrifice. Friends, it's not about our self-sacrifice. It's about the Christ sacrifice. That is the only way. Now, now, the beautiful picture is if you understand the Christ sacrifice and if you're trusting in the Christ sacrifice, hopefully you are living a holy life. And hopefully you are self-sacrificing your life. But you're doing it because you're a Christian, not because you want to show yourself 
to be a Christian. There's a very big difference in how we come to this, and the teaching is, is subtle, and the teaching can be very deceptive. Um, notice this. This ungodly teaching is super dangerous, and it's eternally damning. You see, if you are trusting in what you do, whether it's from a legalistic point of view or whether it's from a self-sacrifice point of view, you are still in your sins unforgiven and therefore not accepted by God. Christians need to see this and understand this and be reminded of this. Look at verse 15. Here he's going to explode this and explain this. To the pure, all things are pure. This is saying to the person who has been made clean. This is saying to the person who has come to Christ and been made clean, all things are pure. The issue is, is that you're not, you're not trying to make yourself pure, and you're not, you're not trying to show yourself pure. You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled, and notice what it says after that. He says, and unbelieving. Circle that. So he's clarifying, this is talking about the people who've never come to the fountain of Christ. These are the people who've never been to Calvary. These are the people who have never truly been washed in the blood of Lamb. These are the people who, they are unbelieving, they've they've not come to believe in Christ, and they are still dirty in their sins. They're still defiled. They haven't been made clean. And so to them, nothing is pure. No matter what they do, it's still not pure. But both, look what the text says in verse 15, but both their hands and their consciences are what? Defiled. That means nasty, not accepted by God. And so the apostle Paul is saying to Titus, Titus, All of this workspace salvation is in these churches. They're not holding on to what Jesus did for us. You have to go silence this. This is the oldest lie in the the world, that you, by your, your own efforts, can make God proud. The picture isn't about what we do. It's about what Christ did and getting that down by the grace of the Lord Jesus into our heart. Notice this, Jewish ritual purity is no substitute for the cleansing of salvation in Christ. That's what verse 15 is about. To the ones who are pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, ain't nothing that's going to make them clean. And they even think that everything's okay. Look at the next line there. Their unbelief leaves their mind and their heart deceived. Their unbelief leaves their mind and their heart deceived. Now, I want you to see this in verse 15. Everybody look at verse 15 again in the box. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and the unbelieving, nothing is pure. Look at the end of it. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. This has to do with the fact that without a regenerated, renewed, washed over mind and heart, we we think that even our works are still working on our behalf. We're we're defiled. We, We don't even realize our consciences are not spoken to. Our consciences are not brought to sensitivity. We are lost and we are deceived in thinking that everything is fine. So, In fact, think about this. The more religious you are and the more you keep the law, the better you are at it, the more you think what? Oh, I'm really saved. I'm really doing good. I mean, I'm trying not to look down my nose at everybody else, but I'm really something. God must be glad to have me on his team. He's sending more welcome crew when I get to the gates of heaven. I mean, this is the, you see, all of those works wind up deceiving you more because you think that your righteousness and your acceptance is based upon what you're doing. 
Or what about the person that's over here on the other side? All the sacrifice. I'm really sacrificing this, and I really sacrifice that, and I don't do this, and I don't do that. And I, you know, I, I recycle the plastic, and I redo this, and you know, you know, whatever it is. I'm really good about all these things, and man, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being very sacrificial in this. And you see, the more, the more that they may sacrifice, the more that they may think, well, God must be really, really proud of me. But it all has to do with a deception that is great. Look at verse 16. This is so powerful. and It's right there on your, on your outline. They say, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. Now, these are people that do a lot of works. But their works are what's condemning them because they're trusting in their works instead of Jesus. So look what it says. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Wow, so they can't even do good works. Because all of their understanding and all of their motivations are off. You see, friends, Jesus, truly coming to Jesus and truly coming to realize that your only hope is in his forgiveness and is in his salvation and what he did on the cross, that is what opens us up to now be able to do good works, is realizing that he did the greatest work of all. And so this is so critical to understand the gospel deeply, and this is why Titus is told by Paul, Titus, you go nuts on this. You go silence them, you refute them, you show everybody why they're wrong, because they are detestable, they're disobedient, and they're unfit to do anything good, because they don't get the gospel. Is this making sense? That's not a rhetorical question. Is this making sense? I hope you're getting this because this could be the difference in you going to heaven or you going to hell. I'm not kidding. If you subtly somehow have grown up in church all your life, grew up at Sheridan Hills, and somehow you're subtly, you, you, somehow your heart has never been pricked to, to just bleed for openness to Christ and what he has done. And if you've never listened and opened your heart to the voice of Christ calling you to trust in him and not yourself, friend, you do not know God. And that is exactly what it says in verse 16. They profess to know God, but they deny him. And these are people who are doing good works in a church, and yet they deny him. Um, These works are not sufficient to save. So fill this in underneath the notes on verse 16. It says their religious works actually compound their condemnation. It compounds their condemnation because it is self-righteousness instead of, and you can put out there to the side, instead of Christ-righteousness. They're thinking highly of themselves instead of thinking highly of Christ and what he has done for them. Notice the next part there. Their self-righteousness without forgiveness leaves them unacceptable to God. Now, you talk about a message for family camp. I mean, first of all, a dad and a mom need to clearly understand the gospel and be in in absolute amazement at the grace of God that would save us. I mean, uh, the, the words of the great hymn, Amazing Grace, are beautiful, Because amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a good works guy like me. Is that what it says? No. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. You see, this is the salvation of God, not the salvation of yourself. It's not you saving yourself. It's God's salvation. So, and it's that which now makes us acceptable to God as opposed to leaving us unacceptable. The ver- end of verse 16, look what it says there. It says, they are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. 
That means they are not accepted by God. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 are some of the absolute most beautiful verses that make this so very clear. And for every person in this room today, notice these words. This is the exact opposite of the message of the preachers on Crete. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It's not a payment of God. It's a gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the gospel that was being missed at Crete. And this is the gospel that subtly, somehow, is being missed all across American churches. People go to church, feel good about themselves. They give, they sacrifice, they serve. They'll even go change diapers in the nursery occasionally. And they think, boy, I must be, I must be a true Christian. I must be doing pretty good. Let me tell you that the only thing that makes us a true Christian is coming before a holy God and recognizing that we are bankrupt in our sin, that we have nothing to offer him except obedience to his call to believe. And we turn to him in belief, and we allow his grace to wash over us and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. We call upon him to forgive us of our sins. We recognize that Christ is the only hope, and we say, God, you have said all who call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. You have said that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You said to as many as those who believed in him, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believed in his name. That means believe that he is Lord Messiah. Not me. Not my grandfather who was a Baptist preacher. Not my saintly mother. Christ in Christ only. Friend, if you've never committed your heart to Christ in this, may the message to the Cretans be the message to your heart. And may you say, if not ever before, today I want to put my faith only in Christ, only in Christ. Lord, root it out in my heart. Show me where I've been falsely believing in myself falsely believing in the things of this world, falsely believing in something other than what you did on the cross for me because I don't want to be lost in my sin. Friend, if God has given you the grace to cry that out, even while I'm preaching, you begin to cry that out. And don't leave this building today without going to someone on either side here or in the back and saying, I I want what you were talking about. I want what Christ can do. You see, notice this at the very bottom. The true gospel makes clear that man's works-based righteousness, this is righteousness that only, the, the idea is righteousness that comes from works, only has the power to condemn. That's what he's saying. Their, their works even condemn them further. Look at this, while God's grace-based righteousness has the power to what? To save us. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. I pray that we hold on to this message as a church. I pray that we root out the opposite of this message from our hearts from anywhere where it were to show up in our teaching, that we would be very, very careful both in word and in deed to confess our faith in Christ alone. Let's pray together.